Hey guys, we're here live. And once again, it's Thursday. So once again, it's the TIP for the SIP because it's WT. So hey, Hasmoni again, thank you all for joining us um, for another Brutico uh, virtual tasting session. Uh, tonight, gonna be a lot of fun. Some uh, Brutico Slavia Block and Primitivo. Um, as always, I've got Kevin Brutico with me. Say hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. And David Brutico's here. Hello. And then out there in the ethosphere or internet or whatever you want to call it, we have Steve Brutico kind of listing in the background, kind of like your own private Brutico stalker. It's kind of fun. Anyway, so salute and cheers, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Got to start with a little wine. All right. So before we dive into the wines too much tonight, a couple of questions have been asked about glassware and about different glasses. So I wanted to get into that really quick. Um, in front of me are two of the, the classic glass sizes. Um, this glass right here is a Bordeaux style glass is what it's considered. This is usually for red wine, uh, especially for uh, Cabernets and, and so forth, uh, any Bordeaux varietals. Uh, it's a classic shape. This one, this one right here is a burgundy glass. So this is really your Chardonnay, Pinot Noir style glass. The reason why the different shapes of the glasses are is how they, um, the wine enters your mouth and how you smell them. So classically with a, with a Bordeaux style glass like this, which most people have in their houses and use, it's to be able to get that long slender style, it's to really push the aromas directly into you and then it's to actually deliver the wine to the back of your palate first because they're usually bigger, richer, fuller wines that kind of round out into your mouth. With burgundy style, which because they're a little bit lighter and more delicate, what you're trying to get is you get that great aeration. That's why the bigger bowl on the bottom, a little narrow in the top, narrows down. It's so you can get those more delicate flavors and aromas coming out. And it's made for you to get uh, more towards the front of your palate. Um, so there's all kinds of different wine glasses out there. Um, and each glass for different varietals, uh, you know, this is probably the most common glass everybody has. Um, Let's get here where you guys can see it. The most important thing about a glass, it's the thickness of the glass. You want thin glass. If you get those thicker, like the old style, you always saw at the Italian restaurants, short, squatty, really thick glass, the glass does interfere with the flavor profile of the wine. You need something a little bit thinner if you really wanna judge it. That's probably the most important thing. Uh, these glasses like we use in our taster we have is kind of a hybrid glass. You get a little bit of everything. They're developed to really push aroma so you can really smell it a lot better. And then there's all kinds of different glasses. Uh, this is called the official tasting or judging glass. Uh, this is what we actually use in the winery. It's a little bit smaller, narrower, and it's really made to really develop the aromas so you can really smell them and taste the, and smell the wine so you can taste the wine, right? You have to have both. So it's a little bit smaller, easier to handle, easier to judge and look at. Again, it's a very thin glass to do that. Other more exotic glasses are glasses like this, which is a blackout glass. This glass is actually a glass used for teaching. The reason why is you can put whatever you want in this and you don't know what it is. You really have to use your nose to smell the aromatics to judge the varietal. And it forces you to use your nose to judge the wine more. So it's a very great learning tool. So all you guys that have little wine tasting clubs or do wine tastings, it's a great thing to have to play around with every once in a while. Um, so tonight it's just got my clear liquor in it, but it's good. Um, so then the other styles of uh, wine glasses that are traditional um, in most Italian households, it would be this one. Uh, this one, you know, it's just a jelly jar and it works great and people love it. And I drank out of this when I was a kid uh, to do that. Uh, when I grew up, I started moving on to just regular mason jars. So it all depends on what you like. I'll be honest with you. Thinner glass is gonna give you more appreciation of the wine, the wine's gonna show a lot better. Uh, but then there's those times when you want to appreciate wine and those times you want to drink wine. So, you know, that's kind of how you look at it. And then of course, the favorite glass at any winery is a beer mug, all right? So, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, just remember that I have a master's degree in this temporary of speaking from Hopland University. Um, and that was with a bachelor's in cow excrement. So take it for what it is. All right, so tonight we're gonna move on a little bit 
talk a little bit more about the wines. So uh, the Sauvignon Blanc we did the first week was our Bliss Sauvignon Blanc. I hope you guys enjoyed the videos, kind of showing you the differences in the vineyard itself. Um, and the one on the soil change was uh, in our Barbera was very drastic, but it's a great one to really show you when I talk about soil change. It's a very drastic one, but there is a big soil change. So tonight we're going to go move on into the Brutico Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so as far as food pairings go um, with the Sauvignon Blancs, um, I like seafood with it. I like shellfish especially. Fresh oysters uh, are excellent. I just, you know, the brininess of the oyster with the Sauvignon Blanc, um, you know, with whatever little sauce you want with it, it's good. Um, you know, fresh, uh, fresh or dried, like, you know, dried mangoes and, and dried uh, fruits, apricots, that type of stuff. Also in almonds, really good, but like scallops, Mussels, I'll tell you what, man. Mussels and clams, scallops, awesome, and oysters. I mean, that's when I have Sauvignon Blanc. Um, even, you know, go get some shrimp and cocktail sauce. I mean, it's just, it works with it. Sauvignon Blanc is that great backyard, um, warm weather wine. That why you're enjoying those types of uh, meals outside uh, and with your family and friends. It's just perfect. Um, and or with your dog, like Nui. That's my dog that you saw running around out there in the video. Um, the black mamba we like to call her, or Dobby, and you'll understand why you'll see her in more videos as we go along. Um, so the other thing though is for if I'm looking at a meal with Sauvignon Blanc, I'm thinking things like chicken piccata. And the reason why I said that, you gotta think about the capers and lemon juice in it. And it really lends itself to the Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, so things like that I think really work well with Sauvignon Blanc. That's kind of one of my favorite food pairings. Uh, but usually by the time I get done eating all the oysters, shrimp, scallops, and mussels, I really could care less what I eat at that point in time. Right? So there it is. All right, so let's go ahead and taste. So this wine comes from the section that we showed you, the Brutico section, and the soil's a little bit darker, a little bit richer, um, and it really has a lot more tropics in it. Um, I love that it's kind of got this tangelo thing going on in it, and uh, and you get some mango and definitely that pineapple. That pineapple is in the back and in, in, uh, going through it, but it's that it's kind of a citrusy, but it's not. And it's that mango. So this is exactly the same vineyard that the Bliss comes from, but it's a totally different style. Um, it is a touch sweet, uh, just because that's this vineyard came in a little hot. I didn't want to ferment it all the way through because the alcohol would be too much and I didn't want to try to re-ferment it either. So I left it, that little touchness in it that helps with that mouthfeel. But still, it gives you that, the, that great mangoes, that little bit of pineapple. Again, that tangelo. I love that tangelo right on the edge of the glass. And that's where that thinner glass really helps you out in bringing that in. Now when you taste this and you put this in your mouth, you get that nice tartness, you get that citrusness, you get that kind of a tangerine tartness. It's not lemony like the Bliss is, but it's more like a tart orange kind of flavor profile. And then it comes out and you're starting to see that all of a sudden there's like a papaya or uh, I don't know if you guys have had star fruit before, a star fruit kiwi and there's a honeydew aspect to it where the sweetness comes in. And it's got that little touch of acid right past the mid palate, rolls all the way through that finish, which carries all that fruit through. So it's a little bit bigger mouthfeel than most Sauvignon Blancs. And because of that, that's where that chicken piccata works. Uh, that's where you can take a food like that, even though it's a chicken that is, is lightly battered and coming through with the sauce, it works really well with it. So, so anything that's kind of got a little bit of a lemon sauce, um, I think works really well with, with this wine. Um, like I said, you know, um, in the mornings, um, you know, for brunch, it's a great wine, you know, hollandaise sauce. It's just gonna work perfect with this wine. So if you're doing that 10, 11 o'clock backyard brunch, um, Easter's already gone, but we can do Easter too once we're out of this quarantine and you can have that with your, uh, with your hollandaise sauce, right? Now this wine is just like the Bliss Sauvignon Blanc. It's cold fermented on purpose and that keeps all those aromas and those bright esters, as I'm ringing wine glasses every time I put my elbow down. Um, these nice bright esters that are ringing. Um, so 
those are held because of the cold fermentation. It's about 50, 55 degrees. Um, we keep it that way right up until towards the end, and then we let it warm itself up, and then that finishes the fermentation for us uh, coming through. When uh, we're picking this, the funny part is, is all these flavors I'm talking about, I actually taste those out in that vineyard. That block is almost three quarters of a mile long between the two, between block five and seven when you walk it. And I'll walk the Brutico section through block five all the way up into block seven um, and, and taste the grapes. And you can see the flavor profiles. That's how I distinguish the Bliss and the Brutico. It's when the flavor profile changes, that's where I make my mark. That's where I know, okay, now we're into the, the bliss side because now it's really citrusy. All of a sudden these lemons are coming through and limes and, and brighter citrus notes where this wine here, the, you're getting a lot more pineapple, a little more grapefruit uh, in the grape itself. And then all of a sudden when they're ready to pick, it's like papaya and mango. It's, it's distinctive and you know it when you taste it. Um, it doesn't, the numbers that we look at when we're, we're sugar testing can tell us a lot but it's not until you can taste it. Uh, my old mentor, George Bursick, taught me a long time ago, once you pick it, it's done, right? So that's kind of how it works. Uh, so until I get the flavors I want, I'm not gonna pick it. And, uh, and it's uh, a great deal having your own vineyards, being a state winery, because we can do that, all right? Um, the other thing about Sauvignon Blanc is, uh, probably the only white other than bubbles or sparkling wine that I like colder uh, than I do uh, my Chardonnay. Chardonnays I usually like a little bit warmer um, this, the, the, just because of the flavor profiles that come out. Uh, but because this is such a cold fermentation, I think it, it lies itself to being a little colder when you're drinking it. That way it's a little more refreshing. That's why it's a great wine when it's a little bit uh, warmer outside uh, because of that, because it is a little bit colder. Now, it doesn't mean I only drink Sauvignon Blanc uh, during the warm months. No, I pretty much drink Sauvignon Blanc year-round. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite wines because it is so bright and beautiful and it's so refreshing at the same time. Um, so we talked a lot about how we harvest Sauvignon Blanc when we did the Bliss Show. And we might come back to this wine again and talk about it later on. Um, the 19 will be coming out later on in the summer when we do these shows again to do that. A lot of the videos that you saw earlier uh, before we started up were videos that I walk around the vineyard and I shoot. And I do a lot of that even during harvest. Um, if you want to see them, see a little bit more, some of the stuff like that that's happening, uh, Kevin's really good. He pulls them off my Instagram page, which I usually post there all the time, and he puts them on ours. But if you go to at Haas Maloney on Instagram, you can see him whenever. Um, when I'm doing a lot of little tidbits in the winery and, and going around. So you're more than welcome to, to follow that, to, to see different things too. Um, so with Sauvignon Blanc, like we're talking about, this is actually a, uh, this was from the Bordeaux, kind of Bordeaux section. This is kind of like the, the white Cabernet in Bordeaux. Uh, we see this kind of grown a little bit more in France. Uh, so this style is, I would say this style of our Sauvignon Blanc for 2018, a little more fume style, even though it doesn't see barrel, it's that little bit more richness in the mouthfeel like a Fumé Blanc would have. Um, and it is 100% um, Sauvignon Blanc, and it's 100% from our Felice Vineyards, which I was walking through earlier and showing you that. So, to do. All right, cool. So that's kind of Sauvignon Blanc land. Uh, and we're going to kind of move on down into Primitiva. So the biggest, the, the Question I get asked the most about Primitivo is, isn't Primitivo Zinfandel? I'm gonna tell you, no, it's not. Um, other people will argue that it is. People will start throwing scientific research and all those other things. I'm gonna tell you as a winemaker, it's not because it doesn't act the same as Zinfandel. Um, Primitivo, I believe the easiest way to explain it is, Back in Italy, in southern Italy, Primitivo is the second most planted grape in Italy. Sangiovese is number one, Primitivo is number two, grown mainly in the south. So Primitivo is like the great, 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 great grandfather who is, uh, who is in Italy, all right? And Zinfandel is like the great, 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 great grandson that came over to America at some point in time. Although their lineage is similar, their family is similar, they are not the same. They don't act the same, dress the same, talk the same, or anything. 
When Primitivo seems to be more about the lighter red berry fruits, it likes French oak a lot more than it does American oak. Where Zinfandel seems to be a little bit darker on the fruit profile, the blackberries, you know, the more peppery. And it also seems to, not, it loves American oak. Let's just say point blank. American oak and Zinfandel are made for each other. So that's, i have seen those differences on how the wines react and grow in similar in areas. Um, they are definitely different. And there was, they did go back and test the mother vine in Italy and found that it did not match um, the second time they went and tested it. So the Italians are saying foul, but we'll find out. But no matter where it comes from, I love them both. And they're both great wines to drink. So uh, Primitivo. Uh, it's growing up on top, and in fact, there's the picture right there, uh, and you saw the video, that's block 12, it's a very steep uh, area where this comes from. We use a little bit of block 11, uh, because we can't uh, make enough Primitivo for both the Primitivo um, designated wine and Quadriga, which it goes into. So our Primitivo um, is uh, all hand-picked um, for Brutico, and that's mainly due to the topography. We can't get a, uh, a machine up there. So we have to pick it by hand, which lends to the winemaking style. Um, we pick again on flavors. So when we're out there and we're looking at the Primitivo, um, I'm, I'm looking to, to get that, that fruit. I want a fruit quality. You get a little spice in Primitivo. I, in our Primitivo, not as much as we do in our Zen, but there is a little bit of spiciness in there. Um, and it's very faint, uh, but it's not peppery, but there is some spice. Now in this Primitivo from 2016, again, it was a really hot, hot growing season, a very short season. Well, actually it was a very long season, just that we picked really early. Um, so in this, I'm getting those raspberry kind of plummy, but I'm getting more of a dried fruit, more than a fresh fruit aroma out of it. And I'm also getting some, um, a little bit of clove and, uh, and some kind of some, um, a current in it, um, you know, like black currants. So you're getting a, a nice little fruit, a little barrel expression. And there's a little bit of a, that clove is kind of a spiciness, I think, that comes in the back end. So the first thing you get when that wine hits your palate kind of wraps around and you get this really lush bright fruit in there and then that turns into this kind of this little espresso tobacco which is the French oak that we use and then that kind of lingers on with the uh, with that current almost that black current kind of uh, flavoring and some uh, and more spices going on the back end so the French oak barrels this is about 25 percent new French oak it's 100% French oak barrels, but only 25% of them are new, as we explained before. And those barrels are some of my favorite barrels. Uh, we're going to probably talk more about barrels next week, uh, do a little video shoot. But this has, um, and that's kind of the aroma that I'm getting, is uh, the oak notes that I'm getting is from that, uh, from that barrel. It's a Tronze Juple blend uh, with their basically a uh, center of France forest. They're three-year-old barrels on purpose uh, because we want the, the little bit extra extraction and fire bent. And that's kind of giving it that little bit of spiciness. That's where that espresso and that, uh, and that kind of sweeter caramel kind of clove is coming from. Us, are espresso and tobacco hallmarks of French barrels? No, it's a hallmark of toast. So what happens is, usually what happens is, depending on the length of toast, you'll get more of that espresso bean you can still, we get it in our American oak barrels. You'll see it, you'll also see it in um, Eastern European Yugoslavian barrels too. Um, not as much, but it's usually how the barrels toast it, the length of heat and the depth of heat is we can re that. Uh, what exactly sets uh, is a little more unique to a French barrel versus the other? Well, French barrels for one thing are um, hand split. So American oak is a different uh, species of the same oak family, um, but the French oak is such a straight grain and is not as dense as American oak. So both are straight grain, 
But American oak is very dense and it has a lot more, it's called tallulose. So basically, the best way to explain it is that um, the grain of the wood goes up like this. And across that grain are these little blocks, like cell walls, that block across called tallulose. So in French oak, let's say in one inch, there's a hundred of those. Well, in American oak, there's about a thousand of those. So which means that you can split, uh, you can saw cut American oak and it won't leak. But if you saw cut French oak, there's not enough tylosis to stop the liquid from working through the pores and coming out. We'll go into more on that um, later on, but it's just how the oaks grow in, that, in, uh, in France and how they're handled is much different than here in the United States um, because weather and topography makes the oaks taste different. So that's kind of, that's the big major difference. They are two different families or two different species of the same family, but they are really different on flavor profiles. All right. Uh, someone else is wondering about, um, they're noticing that you're kind of smelling with one side, one nostril, a dominant nostril. Is that a, a thing that you've noticed? Not really. It's, you know, it's just you get used to, you turn your head one way or the other. Um, you know, it's like being right-handed, left-handed. I guess I'm left nostril. I don't know. But uh, right, I mean, I find right myself, nostril. yeah. I find myself, yeah, I will usually just turn my head to one side or the other a little bit more, especially this time of year with allergies, <laughs> just which side's clear. But um, I don't know if there is such a thing, because once you get up into your science cavity, I don't know if it really matters, but it's a good question. Any doctors out there gonna answer that for me? No. What is your preferred toast level? Um, I like a medium plus. So most, which means it's a longer, slower toasting to get to, it's a medium plus slow or medium plus long is what it's called. So what it does is they use a lower temperature for a longer period of time, kind of like when you're barbecuing or you're smoking a piece of meat, same thing. I like it a little bit longer at a lower heat because it's a slower penetration and you don't lose all of those esters from the oak. Because what happens is, if, as the heat goes up inside that barrel to get to toasting level, it volatilizes a lot of the aromas out, so you're losing what you're trying to hold. So while you're caramelizing the sugars in the oak, you do it slowly and it retains those. So and it's kind of like the, the cold fermentation on the Sauvignon Blanc to retain those aromas. It's the same thing. If we did it faster and used it a little hotter, we wouldn't have all those great fruit aromas that we do have in that. So to do these different things. So that's kind of why we do what we do, uh, going back and forth. So again, this is all hand-picked, and you saw those hillsides, and I'll tell you what, man, there's my hats off to our crew that goes out there and picks these grapes. You're running up and down that hillside with 35-pound lug of grapes, um, and hopefully not too far. We try to keep the tractor as close as possible to them, um, so they're not really moving more than 10, 20 feet, if, if at all. Um, and we actually bring, the, bring stuff back around, even when it's not full all the way, because of that. Um, so, I mean, these, the guys in the vineyard department do an awesome job and our year-round crews out there picking for us, picking these grapes, um, they really, they care. And everybody here at Brutico is just great because everybody cares and everybody wants to do the best they can um, because of that. And then my job is once they get here is to make sure we don't screw them up, is to make sure that these grapes um, are treated properly and then we can express all that hillside and soil uh, that I'm showing you is expressed in the wine and in the aromas. Um, and you can see there's some consistency um, through all that uh, with year to year. Uh, sometimes things will be highlighted more than the other, but that's the growing season, that's mother nature. Uh, but we try our best uh, to do all that. Um, the other thing that helps out a lot about this is this is another wine that really shows well because we do a lot of early punch downs and or pump overs. A lot of experiments with this wine um, over the years that we actually do part of it in small one-ton fermenters, some of it goes into a next size up five-ton fermenter, and then some of it goes into another larger fermenter, which is about a 10 to 15-ton fermenter. So we, we try to keep them, and each one gives us a different flavor and a different profile, so that's why we do that. Um, and we've kind of narrowed it down to probably one yeast that we really like, which really shows a lot more, okay? Again, food pairings for Primitivo. Think about anything that goes with Zin, it's gonna go with Primitivo. 
But I think what Prima Tivo shines is with more wild game that's really lean. I really love it with elk. Uh, I think shows off really good because there's kind of a sweeter meat, elk and bison. Um, but Haas, I don't have a supply of elk and bison in my freezer as well. You know, it actually also works as you can go buy a ground bison at Costco if you can find it, uh, making a bison burger. We'll talk about that next week with Rosé, one of my ultimate favorite things to do. And, uh, and pork, of course. Pork's going to work really well with this. Um, think, about, think about like a wood fire pizza. And this is where I think this wine shines the best because it has a little more acid in it than, uh, than Zinfandel usually does because it's Italian-esque. A wood-fired pizza in this wine, and I don't care what you put on it, though, it's going to be awesome. You can do from a marguerite to a spicy, uh, spicy sausage uh, to, you know, a chicken pesto, whatever. Uh, it's, that, it's that char, that charcoal, that smoky aroma, that flavor that goes in a thinner crust wood-fired pizzas. And this wine, I think, really do well. Uh, so uh, support your local wood-fired pizza guy. Hey, there you go. Um, then, of course, pasta. You know, any type of pasta you want to make with the red sauce, uh, even a cream sauce. But um, I would think that probably this would go really good. Uh, I'm just thinking just your basic marinara. I would love this wine with. I think it would just be perfect. Uh, or just your basic meat sauce. Or in my house, it's called your gravy. Or as my daughter thinks, it's soup. So she just eats a bowl of that. So, which works too. That's all you need is that and a good piece of French bread and you're done. So. All right, I think that's pretty much got us to the point where uh, we can talk about anything you want to talk about, ask any questions. We're going to hit that happy hour time. Um, I'm glad to uh, keep going with the, any questions you might have. I think we've pretty much hit everything else. Just want to remind everybody we're still doing a one cent shipping. Um, oh, I know what we need to talk about. Guess what's coming up? So just to let you guys know, next week is the rosé and our uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, from Anderson Valley. We have selected the next three tastings, which I'm actually very excited about. Um, so after the Rosé and Pinot Noir, we're going to be doing a Merlot night. That's going to be Torrent and our Reserve Merlot. So we're going to get more into the reserves. So I'm actually going to be going out. We'll shoot some video of the soils uh, so you can actually see the rocky soils that we're talking about um, and actually see the Merlot vines and we'll talk about the, the Syrah and all that. The next week after that, which would be May 7th, it's cab time. Um, so it's our Brutico cab and our reserve cab. We'll be talking about those two nights. So we'll be going actually out into block six. I'm going to show you some different areas uh, and, uh, and talking about what's that, because that's going to really tie in with Torrent, too. You're going to see similarities in those, two, uh, in those two videos, talking about the same thing. And then right now, we schedule all the way out to May 14th. And that's going to be Reserve Chardonnay and Coro, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, so we'll be talking about our, uh, our Coro. So it's going to be kind of a lot of reserves and some other wines coming up. Um, so we'll talk a lot about those. Uh, starting next week or starting the week after that, we get into Torrent, a lot about red wine making. We're going to talk a lot more about red wine making. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about barrels and how they interact with Pinot. Um, and how the, in the processes we go through on how to make rosé um, and how our rosé is made and the decision-making process for that also to do. Um, let me check my list. I think we got most all that. I know there's been some different questions on things, but we'll see what questions you have first. And um, just to let you know, vineyard-wise, what's going on. Um, again, they've been out mowing, uh, retraining some vines. We've been out spraying with uh, silent oil which is uh, solid oil is a, if I remember correctly, it's an organic and sustainable oil that it's used. Um, what style oil is, it's actually white mineral oil grade, is what it's, what it's called. Um, we put that on for a fungicide instead of sulfur. And at the same time, when you put oils on, use essential oils like this, is what that's considered, they do the same in pairs, it doesn't allow insects to lay their um, eggs um, or you cover the eggs and, and it suffocates the egg so the egg doesn't uh, hatch. So it's also, it helps in that way. That's just a small little sideband that it does. Um, and usually those types of insects are not, are, are insects that are not helpful. Those are actually the insects that do damage. Um, usually because the insects that are most helpful for us do not live on the grapevine. They actually live on the riparians around the grapevine 
or in the grasses. It's the ones that actually live on the grapevine are usually the most dangerous to us. Um, so it helps with that a little bit, but it's mainly uh, through management. And that's one of the ways Brutico, uh, we grow sustainably and organically at the same time as much as possible. We're here uh, doing that. We'll talk a little bit more about the wildlife that we have around our vineyards. And if you notice in our vineyard, the videos from earlier on, if you go back and go to our YouTube website, um, you'll actually hear the birds and, you'll, and things are happening there. So it's a little bit different. It's, uh, we do have some nature. We do take care of the, of the riparian ways around us and the animals and the, and the natural insects in, that are in our vineyards and make sure that they're protected. So it's very important to us. All right, so who's got a question? So uh, one question I saw was um, the, uh, how does the 15 compare to the 16? I know a lot of people do have the 15 still. The 16 is a new release, so they're wondering, you know, if, if you know the difference. Uh, the 16 is a little darker. I think the, the 15 is more vibrant uh, with the fruit. So it's really red raspberry. It's a lot more vibrant. Where this, and you're not gonna get that current cranberry dried fruit aspect in this 15, where in the 16, you're gonna get a bigger, more, uh, more richer style of Primitivo. Um, I, I mean, I love the 15 and I love the 16 too. They're a little bit different, but that's the, I think that's where the biggest difference is, is that you're gonna see that um, in, the, in the fruit profile. A um, little bit more, a um, little more barrel showing here, I think, than in the 15, a little more espresso being here, espresso than you saw in the 15 also. So. Um, okay, so another question is, uh, when you're getting ready to blend, you have to watch your diet in some way not to interfere with your palate that day. Yeah, it's breakfast especially. I don't, um, I try, when I do blends and tastings, I try to do them in the morning before I have any snack. I'll usually, usually shoot for around nine o'clock. Uh, by then, I've had, you know, I start at the winery usually anywhere from, I don't know, 5.30 to 6.30 in the morning. I've already had my coffee by seven. Um, and, you know, and I won't have anything to eat till after I taste and put the blends together on purpose because I don't want it to interfere. It's really easy to do. Um, in the, the main thing is like from the night before, nothing I really worry about. It's mainly just breakfast or whatever snacks uh, that you're having during that time to do that. One other thing we want to let you guys know is that um, keep apprised with us on social media and on our website. Um, we are going to be trying to put this on YouTube live next week. Uh, we're going to play with that a little bit. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that so you guys can just watch it from the app on your TV if you want or uh, anywhere else and don't have to actually dial into Zoom. Uh, but that's what we're kind of, we're working on that right now. And hopefully that's where we'll be next week uh, to do. So we'll, we'll let you know for sure. Um, what else we got going on? Uh, so a question about Primitivo versus Quadriga. I'm not sure in what context, but maybe uh, uh, the differences in what you might pair with them, uh, how they compare. Uh, what characteristics you get more dominant in one versus the other? Well, because Quadriga's a blend, it's gonna be a lot more versatile to go with a lot of more styles of food. Um, because you have the Sangiovese, the Barbera, and the Dolcetto in there, along with the Primitivo. So Primitivo, you're gonna be a little more limited on what foods pair well with it, because you don't have the, you don't have that Sangiovese, the, the bigger acidity of the Sangiovese. And that, and that strawberry fruit, and you don't have that floral component of Dolcetto and the ass of the Barbera to really make it go with a lot of different foods. So I think that's the biggest difference. You'll always be able to take this, if you have the 16 and you have the 16 Quadriga, taste them side by side, you'll see great similarities. But then at the same time, if you have them with your different cheeses, you're going to see how it's totally different. That's where it's really going to show up is with food. So side by side in a glass, yeah, there's differences. It's, it's, it's easy to see, but once you have it with food, then you're really going to see how um, the quadriga is really going to wrap itself around and express a different fruit that you didn't taste before, where the Primitivo won't quite do that as extravagantly or as sharply, I guess. We got another question about um, uh, 
ageability of white wines. Mm -hmm. uh, if maybe if you want to touch on that, so. So it all depends on the wine and how the wine's made. I mean, in general, I would say that um, like our Sauvignon Blancs are probably they're good for you know a good five years easily. I mean, that's, I would say, hands down. They might even last longer than that. This Sauvignon Blanc, the 2018, probably go a little bit longer um, than the Bliss. But the Bliss is still going to be good for about five years. But again, it's a white wine. It's a, it's a style that the wine's made in. They're made to be consumed. They're not made to stash away uh, for a long period of time. Um, and that's the vineyard, and that's the winemaking style. Chardonnays, uh, you know, our Chardonnays probably... A little bit longer, especially the barrel ferment Chardonnay. I would think it can go longer than that. They're made to be, you know, aged a little bit longer. Uh, the reserve Chardonnay probably, believe it or not, I don't know if it'll it'll age longer, but the fruit won't be as potent. The oak will probably show through a little bit more uh, than on the um, than on the regular Brutico. So in varietal to varietal, it really depends. It depends on how the wine's made because it's like I've had I've had a Sauvignon Blanc from 100 year old wines that was 10 years old tasted like they just made it last year. So it all depends on the vineyard, the vines, the winemaker and the style on whether they're made to, if it's gonna make it that way or not. So um, it's, you know, I don't really save wines for long periods of time. If I do save wines for long periods of time, I'm buying in larger formats. Why, I don't save whites to, to drink later on except for maybe sparkling wines because they are, their ageability is a lot longer. So. Um, that's the best I can do for you. Well, and, and real quick, I like to point out too to people, everyone likes wine at different points. Some people really love aged wines mm -hmm. and some people like more fresh, vibrant wine. And, and so ageability really depends on what your preference is. Yeah, people drinking, the, the thing is in the United States, we're not used to drinking older wines. In Europe, they're very used to that. You know, in Europe, they lay stuff down for five, six years before they even start to taste it on average. So. And an older wine definitely has a different profile. So you have to be used to that. Uh, and you have to, you know, and, and know how they're gonna taste to be a little bit different. Like older sparkling wines get very nutty, uh, which is great. It's a great little characteristic. And, uh, and they're a lot of fun. They're more food friendly at that point too. Does the screw cap uh, uh, matter for ageability? Uh, five years ago, I would have said yes. Now, no. Uh, I think the screw cap actually helps it age better or longer uh, because you don't have the variability of a natural product where you don't know how much oxygen is going into that bottle where now we actually control we know how much oxygen is going into that bottle so i think it's actually helped with the ageability of our own wine uh, someone would like you to put enough wine in a bottle for two people it's right there <laughs> yeah, it's like we do make it it's, it's right here so that's usually what that's a two-person bottle right there. So, well, and since you have that out, maybe talk about large formats and and the reasons for why we do them. Um, that's a good question. Why do we do this <laughs> stuff? So, we when you're buying wine to lay down, if you buy a bottle of wine that you want to age and you want to, you actually want to sell it for a while. Um, number one, it never should be a three seventy-five a half bottle. It's the worst thing you could ever do. It's I. I don't like half bottles for that reason. They don't last very long. Um, a 750 like this, um, depending upon the wine and the shape of the bottle, it will age very well and probably age just fine. Um, but if you want something that's gonna lay down for 15, 20 years, go for a Magnum, um, which is half of this bottle. Um, this is a three liter bottle, so that's actually four bottles of wine. Um, a Magnum is two bottles of wine. They, the larger the format, the more wine you have, the better it ages and the longer it will age. So if you, want a, if you want a bottle that's gonna last 40 years, this is what you do. Um, if you want a bottle that's gonna go 20 to 40 years, I would say a Magnum is the best way to do it. Um, you know, and then there's the whole decanting process. You know, then there's different things because if you lay a bottle down that's got a cork in it and you use what's called a waiter's, we've call, I've called it a corkscrew all my life, I don't know, all of a sudden, five, six years ago, they're called wine key. Don't ask me. Um, use this, it just shreds the cork out because the cork is just gonna fall apart. It's a natural product. It's still doing its job, but it's usually not the most sustained. So you want something like an osso, um, which is like two prongs that go down the side. You can twist them up and out. It doesn't rip the, it doesn't rip the cork apart. Well, this just kind of rips the center out of the cork. 
Um, you can try the, I've never really used a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, cork removal tools where you actually you're pumping air into it and it brings it out, but it, you know. Um, so, but the, that's the best way. If you're gonna age something and you wanna lay it down for a special light for a special reason, that's why I would do something like this. These are great for weddings to have your guests sign and then for the bride and groom to open 20 years later uh, as a remembrance of your 20th anniversary, 25th anniversary. That's why a lot of people kind of do that. Um, bottles go anywhere from here to, uh, and I can never remember the name of it, but there's actually an 18 liter bottle. There's actually bigger bottles than that. That's actually two cases of wine in one bottle. Um, so, you know, uh, that's my suggestion. I just, you know, buy a couple of these. So if one bottle isn't enough for you and your partner, um, buy two. You know, have a his and hers or his and his and hers and hers. It doesn't matter. It's uh, just have one or buy two and have one for your dog and one for yourself. Whatever works. And we do have quite a few uh, three liters available. And we also have coming up a 2015 Magnum uh, cab mm -hmm. Magnums. So you'll see those soon. Um, and then someone asked about smaller bottles uh, for maybe one person. And I might suggest maybe looking into something like uh, the wine pumps, you know, yeah. uh, especially for one person at home. Those pumps work great for one night, two nights. One night's like that. Um, you know, you got to remember as soon as you open a bottle, you pull the cork. So, you know, Corvin is the best thing to do um, because you're putting a needle through the cork um, and you're injecting gas. It doesn't work too well for a screw cap bottle. So that's where you buy some type of a, like um, a wine pump that vacuums them out, put some gas in there. Um, there's, if you go down, if you look online and uh, go down to like your local wine shop, there's like uh, inert gas canisters that you can buy that once you pour, you know, once you pour your wine out, you put the inert gas inside. Um, and that'll help keep it for a couple of days for you uh, to do that. Uh, if I open a bottle of wine and use a little vacuum or wine pump, it helps, you'll, you know, you'll get a couple days out of the wine. Sometimes it actually tastes better the second day because you did that, because now it's actually opened up, so. Okay. All right, Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, it's a quick one tonight, all right. <laughs> well, since it doesn't look like we have any more questions and we're moving on through this, um, again, uh, from the Brutico family and from all of us here at Brutico Bliss Vineyards, we really thank you for joining us and taking part in this. And uh, I really thank you for putting up with me in your homes for this amount of time. Um, even my wife cringes. So um, uh, on that note, I'd just like to say, just remember, drink what you like, drink out of what you like. It doesn't matter what glass I show you or I tell you. If this is your favorite wine glass and this is what tastes best, that's what it is. Um, it's up for the Psalms to tell us differently um, and let them, uh, let them argue about it, that's fine. And just remember the biggest difference between a wine connoisseur and a wino is a wine connoisseur pulls the brown paper bag off the bottle when they're done drinking it. That's about it. So from all of us here, thank you, stay safe, and um, salute, ching ching.